Wow. Okay. All right. Now we're back with you. I cut everybody off. I hope I did. I empty the room or anything. So I have to send off the. Did we have the chat room on again? Okay. All right. And our waiting room. Okay. View. Admit all. We still have a few people joining this morning. Good morning again. My name is Susan Lee with Sedgwick County Health Department. And we are beginning the December presentation of the COVID-19 guidance updates for nursing homes and adult care homes. I go this way over. And today's presentation is being recorded. We have today our presenter with us, Annette Graham. She's our executive director, Central Plains Area Agency on Aging. We have Kaylee Hervey, our epidemiology program manager, our Cedric County Health Department. And then Cody Charvette is on with us. He's with the operations office and Sudbury County Emergency Management. We have our agenda today. We're going to have uh, a section following the presentation for questions and discussion with uh, monthly updates as we will have our meeting scheduled coming in January. And then we'll talk about some CMS testing reporting requirements, the vaccine 19, uh, COVID-19 vaccine partnership program, and the emergency operations update on the PPE stop gap program and N95 decontamination for the respirators. And then we'll talk about a little bit about the emergency public health order, Cedric County phase two and the metrics. And then we'll have a presentation on visitation as per CMS and KDAD. And then we will present a little information on a study that came out presented by CDC MMWR. Anyone having any? Again. Okay. Oh. You can tell. I mean, it's kind of like. Anyone having any questions along the way, please enter them in the chat room and we'll respond to them. And I, I some other uh, additional folks have entered the room. I'm going to just go over once more our for those who are joining just now. Annette Graham is a Central Plains Area Agency on Aging. Kaylee Harvey, she's our Epidemiology Program Manager here at the Health Department. And then Cody Shervet from the Emergency Operations Center. And then again, as the presentation ends, we'll have a period for question and answer. And submit all questions along the way to the chat box, please. And then we've uh, continued uh, providing the monthly updates as per request from our community partners and long-term care and adult care homes. And our next meeting is scheduled for January 12th, same time as today, 11 o'clock to noon. And anyone unable to join at that time will be able to review the recording and the slides on our website. And to present the COVID-19 updates, we have Kaylee Hervey, and I'm going to turn the controls over to Kaylee. She does quite a bit of the presentation here. Thank you, Kaylee. And you can admit folks along the way. Thank you. So as of this morning, the United States, we now have almost 15 million cases, uh, just under that in the United States. We have 174,025 cases in Kansas, and we have 25,969 cases in Sedgwick County. 
Um, we do have 172 deaths in Sedgwick County. And right now we have 48, we've had 48 total uh, adult care home clusters. And we have currently have 604 active cases in those adult care home clusters. So when we move to testing, uh, the CMS is still requiring uh, skilled nursing staff to test, or skilled nursing facilities to test all staff and residents. Um, and that's uh, KDAS guidance issued on October 27th requires you to use the two week county positivity rate published by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment for that uh, testing guidance. And you can go to this website and find that um, testing positivity rate under the nursing home metric. But we've done that for you for today. And so right now, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment has Sedgwick County positivity rate at 21.6%. And they use a current a rolling day, 14 day period. Um, so that is from November 22nd until um, December 5th is where they got that number from. And when you do go to that website, you can click on Sedgwick County to get the information about where, where we are classified for CMS, which is bread, the total tests that they have us uh, registered as doing, our percent positive, and then our current testing rate. So initially CMS has the final rule on nursing facilities and their testing. And so the interim final rule has additional um, regulatory revisions in response to COVID-19, uh, public health emergency related to long-term care facilities, and that uh, testing requirements and revised survey tool is available at this website. So additionally, CMS has provided guidance for uh, COVID testing or SARS-CoV-2 point of care testing. And so that can be found at this website below um, from CDC. And there are regulatory requirements for that point of care testing and who can do that point of care testing. And so anyone doing that testing must have a CLIA or Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment Certificate. So Central County Health Department can um, assist with testing as needed. Um, we can provide NP swabs or saliva testing for CMS guidelines. KDC has also opened a new reporting portal for mandated facilities for the, uh, via the BINAC rapid test. And so you can now report your results directly to KDC through their disease reporting portal at this website. And that is what they are asking you to do. And they are asking you to use that portal for reporting of any of your testing results. If your facility is CMS funded and if a test is positive, then the individual must be uh, NP or nasopharyngeal tested within 48 hours of that positive test. So for health department specific testing for adult care homes, um, anyone at this point, um, so any Central County resident with or without symptoms can be tested at no cost by calling 316-660-1022 to schedule an appointment. That is um, for long-term care staff, they can be tested on a weekly basis. So they can call on a weekly basis for testing. Oh, yeah. uh, if the staff tests positive, other staff and residents in the facility should be tested per health department and KDG recommendation. So when you do have a positive, you can report those to KDG. You can also give the health department a call and we can assist you with figuring out who and um, needs to be tested and, and how often. Test results right now are, can take four to six business days through the health department. They may be faster than that, um, but that is kind of what we're averaging. And if you would like to view our procedure on testing for long-term care facility employees, you can view that at the website on the slide. So saliva testing for nursing facility. We are um, still using the clinical reference laboratory for a lot of our saliva testing. You can register for that program through the health department at the uh, survey gizmo link. If you have questions about that program, you can email meddistribution at sedgwick.gov. And if you've already received those kits from us and need um, a trainer or a refresher on how to collect, you can use this video link at, um, from CRL on how to collect those saliva samples. So 
requirement for reporting for nursing home. Again, all testing results are required to be reported. All point of the point of care system and if you send them out to a lab. And so they must be reported via KDC's reporting portal. If you are sending to a nationally certified lab such as Quest or LabCorp or um, directly to the state, those labs are likely reporting your results directly to KDG. However, you can still report your results through the, that portal. And if you're doing your own point of care testing, you have to report your results through that portal. Um, KDG is sending reports um, to CMS on behalf of the nursing home. And all of those results are available to the local health department. If you have questions, you may contact KDHC at uh, their kdhc.epi hotline at ks.gov email. So we have a question. If a long-term care is not Medicare funded, are residents still required to be tested two times per week or can they be tested less frequently? They can be tested yeah. less frequently. They don't, they don't, they're not under the same CMS guidelines. Yeah, so they can't, yeah. Um, yeah, they can be tested less frequently because they're, uh, those, the twice a week is for CMS. And then the last thing I think is on my list is the COVID-19 vaccine pharmacy partnership. So as everyone knows, a lot has been coming down through um, the governor and, and the CDC right now about the vaccine. We are still kind of following along with our, our plan until we get um, incredibly clear guidance. So we still want you, if you're interested in, uh, if you did sign up at our uh, pharmacy partnership, I apologize, my words are all jumbled today. Um, if you sign through that portal, um, you can go through and we will work with the adult care homes um, who've signed up for this to establish um, any additional information to you about the vaccine. So again, if you want additional information, you can look at KDAD for their guidance on um, COVID-19 vaccination, their FAQ document. And if you do have any questions, please contact the EOC event mine for at cdc.gov. So again, we will be contacting facilities to determine those facilities that signed up to participate in the COVID-19 vaccine pharmacy partnership. And we appreciate your response and cooperation in assisting with our collecting and planning efforts. And as, as stated before, we will try to be, um, as information is provided to us and we are able to share it, we will uh, make sure we are doing so. And at that point, I'm going to turn it over to Cody for requesting and ordering PPE and the I, N95 process. I, I, you can't hear me, correct? I can hear you. All right, very good. Um, Something I want to follow up on what you were just talking about though with the uh, pharmacy partnership. Uh, this may be news to you because it just came out of the BOCC staff meeting this morning. They think they have tasked emergency management with coming up a, with a census, let's call it, of how many doses will be needed to provide coverage for vaccination for all of the healthcare workers at hospitals and then all of the long-term care facility staff and residents. We don't have that number. I don't know if health department has that number or not, but if the, the commissioners insist on getting that number um, to determine, okay, you know, are we gonna have any left over? Let's say we get 30,000 uh, doses from the state. Um, how many of that will be needed to cover what we already know, the priorities, the, uh, the healthcare workers that are exposed to COVID and then long-term care facility staff and residents. So there is a possibility we may, somebody from the county that is, maybe needing to contact a lot of these facilities and get that count from you so that we have that answer that uh, we've been tasked with coming up with. And one other off agenda item, who all felt the earthquake this morning? You don't have to respond verbally, but uh, yeah, I just got some information on that, that it was uh, the epicenter was just uh, to the Southeast of 21st and Rock Road. And it measured the preliminary magnitude is 3.0. So, uh, didn't travel very far, but we were close enough to it that we all got a really fun jolt out of that one. All right, now I'll move on to uh, to what you're expecting out of me and talking about PPE and, and all that type of stuff. And uh, as you see on the, the next slide, 
that uh, this is, has not changed. The facilities licensed by the Kansas Department of Aging and Disability Services may request the PPE through the stopgap program. And you see the list of agencies there. Um, the, the, require, the overall requirement is that your facility must provide patient health care to be eligible or to qualify for ordering information. Now, it is a stopgap program. It's not something that's expected to be used month after month. It's intended to fill the gap until you're able to get these supplies through your normal vendor process. Um, it's not, it, there is no cost for it. Kind of think of it as a grant. There won't be any fee or any um, money associated with ordering for, uh, PPE this way, but there are requirements that you must go through. And we see those on the next slide. When it talks about in order to order through the step gap program, your facility must try to order directly through your vendors. And then if you're unable to get it through your normal channels, then you can contact KDM, the Kansas Division of Emergency Management, through the link that you see there and their stopgap program. Now, those requirements I've talked about, they do require proof. They, can't, they won't just take your word, I'm afraid. So you will need some form of proof of denial, as we say on the slide there. Something that shows that uh, you, know, you ordered the items and they were back ordered or a, a refusal. We've seen this come up that people, uh, a vendor will say, sorry, you're not one of our normal customers. We're only providing to our normal customers. We can't provide to you at this time. Something along those lines is the proof of denial that they're looking for that will get you through the door at the stopgap program. The things that uh, are available to be ordered through the stopgap program are available on the next slide. And that includes masks and face shields, gowns and coveralls, and then the hot item uh, for a lot of folks, uh, gloves is, is the big item. And there are some other PPE require, uh, availability, other PPE items that are available there as well. The, the, uh, the rules that we've been talking about here apply to uh, normal situations. You're trying to order and things, uh, things just aren't filling out uh, the, the way that you normally would expect them to, but there is an important exception if you have an immediate life safety issue. So even if you are on the list of, of private businesses that can no longer order through the, the emergency management channels, if you have uh, an immediate need because of life safety issues, you can still order through us in emergency management here in Sedgwick County. And there you will go to our website, sedgwickcounty.org and find the emergency management page. There is a, a PPE request form on there as well. In fact, it may be on the front page of sedgwickcounty.org as well still. And when you're complete with that, you will fill it out and you'll send it to logistics. Now, you can't really provide we don't really expect you to provide proof that you've had an outbreak or something like that, but just an explanation of why you're ordering this through us. What are your exigent circumstances that, that make this an emergency situation? Maybe it's because you, you've had an outbreak uh, at your facility and you need those certain supplies now and, and can't wait even through, to go through normal vendor channels. What the state is allowing us to do is if we have those supplies in our local warehouse here in Sedgwick County, we can fill your order right away and then we will backfill those supplies by ordering from the KDM after that. But you don't even have to wait for them to come from KDM. You, we can get them to you right away. But again, that's only for, for private businesses rather, that's only in emergency situations. Otherwise you need to go through the stop get program. Of course, as we see on the next slide, the, um, the first responders and other government agencies who might be on this call, they can continue to order through the Sedgwick County Emergency Operations Center. If you have questions about any of these processes, whether the state or us, you see the contact information there. If, if you go to the, the KDEM site for ordering through Stopgap program, they've got an email there for you to direct questions to. Here locally, if you've got issues that you need to get an answer for, logistics at sedgwick.gov is the, uh, the email address you would use to get a hold of our logistics team here at the Emergency Operations Center. We're going to switch gears now and talk about the N95 uh, respirators and the, the, the tail decontamination process that is still active through the end of this month, at least. If you haven't already signed up for them, we highly encourage you to sign up and register with Battelle so that you can extend the life of these N95 respirators. You see the website there, Battelle.org, and then there's some other uh, behind it. But if you just go to Battelle.org, you'll eventually be able to, to figure out where to go there. This is, of course, being offered at no cost to the facilities, 
and it's a great way to extend the life of these uh, N95 respirators. This is a FEMA contract that is paying for Battelle's services. That's why it doesn't cost anything to us. Uh, as we see on the next slide, there are some things to keep in mind about these uh, masks when we're using the, the Battelle system. They have to be clean. So free of visual soiling or contamination, um, even something as simple as makeup would be considered contamination and it would be cause for them to throw the mask out when it gets to their cleaning facility. So we've urged folks for the last several months that perhaps uh, during this particular time, it may be necessary to come up with an internal policy uh, against using makeup if you're going to be wearing an N95 to keep them clean and, and to extend the life on those. So. Uh, you know, obviously we're not going to dictate that for you, but it may be something that you want to consider for your facility. As we see on the next slide, and as I mentioned earlier, the current Battelle agreement is slated through December 30th of 2020. It may be extended. We just haven't heard anything either way that it will or won't. We, it's going to be a surprise to us as well when they make whatever announcement is going to come down the pike. So if it goes away, we do not have anything lined up right now that would take the place of Battelle. So we would need to come up with a plan B, so to speak. And as you see on the next slide, it talks about what we were considering locally before we knew Battelle was going to be an option. Uh, what Cedric County had done was issued our first responders three N95s apiece. And then as they wore one on, the, on day one, as they took it off at the end of the shift, they would put it in a, a paper bag to store it and allow it to self decontaminate over time. So if you have three of them, then you'll have to, you know, you can let them rest for 48 to 60 hours or so in between, depending on the length of your shift. And if they sat there in these breathable bags, then any virus that was in the respirators was allowed to die off naturally. So um, if Patel goes away, this may be something that uh, the agencies turn to us, so what do we do now? This is going to be our answer. It's going to be issue your staff three masks apiece, find some paper bags or something else that will allow them to self decontaminate over that time frame, And uh, we'll have to go about it that way. Uh, unless FEMA decides to extend the, uh, the contract with the Battelle after the first of the year, that's what we're probably gonna be looking at. So that's all I've got, unless any questions come up now or later on and I'll be here. Thank you, Cody. So next I'm going to cover the emergency public health order. So the emergency public health order, um, the Central County Local Health Officer, so individuals, businesses, and organizations are required to comply. It became effective November 27th at 12.01 a.m. and currently is effective through January 9th of 2021 at 11.59 p.m. This order was revised to reduce the spread of COVID-19. So some points in the order are that residents are still required to wear face coverings or masks in public spaces, inside and outside. Again, the definition of mask or other face covering does not include a covering that is equipped with a one-way valve or vent through which air can be exhaled. And there are some exemptions for wearing a mask that are included in the order. The order does allow for a group of 25 or fewer individuals. So 25 is the mass gathering limit right now. And individuals should generally maintain six feet of distance from one or another. And individuals are required to wear their masks within public gatherings, whether inside or outside. You can view the complete order and FAQs at this link below. Um, just a couple other points to the new order. It does, um, also limit capacity on, on most businesses um, in some way. And it also has an enforcement piece now. And so people can report violations to the order through uh, the Cedric County um, website. There is a form you can fill out to report any violations for that order. And then code enforcement and the health department are kind of working together to determine if those complaints are uh, viable and what actions need to be taken. So that is something that's kind of unique and new to this order that hadn't been included previously. So we still are in phase two. For our metrics, um, right now our percent positive is running at about 19.6%. You can see we've had a, a fairly 
sharp increase kind of going up to about the 20s. Um, we've dipped down just a little bit. Um, remember, this is the week of Thanksgiving. And so we kind of expected a slight decrease. And we are monitoring. We're starting to go back up. And we will continue to monitor. Um, we would anticipate a Thanksgiving spike in the next week or so, as well as, you know, we expect to see one for Christmas and potentially New Year's as well. Um, so we don't uh, anticipate numbers going down all that much at this point in time. Although if everybody, you know, stays away, stays home, does what um, they're supposed to do, we, we may see it sooner than that. So metrics are updated at um, this Hedger County website, and you can find those here. They've charts through uh, March 15th through December 5th of 2020. Um, on that metric, the blue part is KDHE metrics. So those are the ones that KDHE focuses on for any decisions they make. Um, we also want to note that numbers can change from report to report because numbers are based on days of when we get the report, not necessarily when people are tested. However, uh, most changes do occur in the uh, most recent two weeks. And then you see when we do report the deaths on there, they are reported by the date of death, which is why most deaths are added um, to previous weeks and not recently. And now I'm going to turn it over to Annette. Okay, uh, so just want to give you a quick update on visitation. Not a lot of changes, but we did want to uh, go through the really one. Uh, oh, yeah. I think you clicked on the you click on the slide. Oh, okay. Okay, so you can find some guidance for the visitations for the holiday season. CMS has urged nursing homes to follow the established guidelines for this holiday season. There are two links here you can go to and see that. Not a lot of changes in that, but it gives you just some discussion points and issues related to a holiday and the residents wanting to go home and how, how that would if they want to go home for a visit. It's some encouragement from CMS to ensure that you continue to follow the established guidelines to ensure uh, low transmission rates. So you can go and see that full guidance at those links established for you. So uh, CDS previously instructed the facilities to use KDHA school screening metrics. They've amended those that they should use two week county positivity rate. And um, again, KDHA already kind of went over that, and that is available at that website uh, and that link there. So the guidance for long-term care settings, uh, the guidelines for all long-term care settings, including nursing facilities, assisted living, board care homes, homes plus residential health care facilities. So essentially all facilities that are licensed by CDAD uh, as adult care homes. So the visitations, the type of visitations incorporated are compassionate care, indoor visitation, outdoor visitation, and a window visitation. So we've got another link here uh, with information on guidelines uh, and what to expect now for visitation. And here's a uh, copy uh, included of those visitation guidelines. And this is really for uh, the residents, family members and residents to really have a better understanding of that. So it's a guide uh, for, as I said, for caregivers, family members to help them understand the visitation and what to expect. The visitation, of course, is in accordance with the facility's environment and the resident's needs. It's very uh, client-specific. And again, uh, to always follow the strict protocols to reduce risk and prevent the spread of COVID-19. So infection control policies, uh, following up appropriate and using the appropriate PPE and social distancing. So the visitation incorporates a very person-centered approach and adheres to the core principles of COVID-19 infection prevention. So for the outdoor window visitation, of course, that poses lower risk of transmission due to the increased space and airflow. Uh, indoor visitation occurs in facilities that are in areas with low to medium county positivity rates and includes visits beyond compassionate care. So that would be in counties that have a 10% or below um, positivity rate. And of course, we are quite a bit above that now. 
cetera, et cetera. So for outdoor visitations, it is allowed with all precautions, even doing, during high time positive positivity rates. So that would require that all visitors be screened for symptoms of COVID-19, that residents and uh, visitors wear a cloth face covering or face mask for the duration of the visit, that social distancing is uh, enforced, and that they perform um, proper hand hygiene. Of course, with the outdoor visitation, that is dependent on the weather. So in inclement weather or extreme cold conditions or and also takes into consideration the health issues of the older adults or the residents. So those all uh, are things to be considered when looking at the outdoor visitation. So for outdoor window visits, um, they should all be conducted in a manner to reduce COVID-19 transmission increase and increase prevention measures and always ensure that provide sufficient space. So when it comes to indoor compassionate care visits, these can and should be provided during any phase. Uh, so even during high positivity rates, facilities will determine when the compassionate care visits are appropriate, which includes but are not limited. The resident is in hospice care. The resident's illness, disease is worsening or life threatening. The resident is exhibiting significant decline physically or mentally. The resident is withdrawing, no longer eating, showing signs of significant depression as a result of loss of contact with family. I did want to share also some additional uh, items or examples that CMS has provided to help you think about this as you make your plans on how to implement compassionate care visits. So when a res resident has been living with family member prior to being admitted to the nursing home, and is struggling with the changed environment and lack of family support. When a resident who is grieving after a close friend or family member has recently passed. When a resident who is now requiring chewing, chewing, to an, an encouragement for eating or drinking, which had been previously provided by family or caregiver and is now experiencing weight loss or dehydration. When a resident who used to talk and interact with others is now experiencing emotionally distress, seldom speaking or crying more frequently when the resident had rarely cried in the past. So allowing visitation in these situations would be consistent with the intent of compassionate care visits. Also keep in mind that compassionate care visits can include, in addition to family members, clergy or lay persons offering religious and spiritual support and that is per CMS. Again, one final thing to keep in mind about compassionate care visits. Person, personal contact during those visits may take place after following all infection prevention guidelines and for limited amounts of time when it is appropriate and would, would be beneficial to that individual. So it's a situationally determined uh, allowance for that. Per CMS, again, when county property rates exceed 10% indoor visitations are not at lab except for compassionate care visits. And remember that compassionate care visits are allowed in any phase. Okay. Uh, visitors with subsequent illness within seven days of the visit should report the illnesses to the nursing facility and or the adult care home and to the Sedgwick County Health Department. So some resources for visitation guidance can be found. CMS guidance was issued September 17th, and there is a link that you can go to for that full guidance. KDEV uh, subsequently put out a document for visitation guidance for long-term settings, which would include the assisted living, board care home, homes plus nursing facility, residential health care facility. So this is um, CMS requirements for nursing facilities that are reimbursed by Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and then KDAD as the licensure, licensee agency for all adult care homes has put out guidance specific for those other facilities that very much mirrors what CMS guidance, but also expands on that. And earlier, somebody had asked a question about testing for uh, facilities that are adult care home licensed, but not nursing facilities reimbursed by benefit. Again, KDAD uh, website has information on those kind of requirements. So I would urge you to go 
go to the KDAS website and look under the podium. Uh, there was recently a study uh, that was conducted for COVID-19 in assisted living facilities. 39 states uh, presented in this uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report. So it continues to recommend that assisted living facilities remain vigilant, such as all long-term care facilities, in their work to prevent introduction and spread of COVID. The study identified actions assisted living should take to prevent the spread of COVID in the facility, which includes rapid identification and response to residents and staff members that are suspected or confirmed as COVID-19 positive. These preventative steps really are what we've been talking about, but it's always good to have a review of that, to identify a point of contact at the local health department's aid and process of notification. Continue to educate residents, family members, and staff members about COVID-19. As we've discussed previously, that you need to have a plan for visitors and staff member restrictions. You need to encourage it uh, and require social and physical distancing, the use of masks as appropriate, and the use of PPE. Implement recommended infection prevention and control practices to provide and provide access to supplies, PPE. Rapidly identifying and properly responding to residents and staff members with suspected or confirmed COVID-19, and to ongoingly provide surveillance of COVID-19 cases and death, facility staffing, and providing information. So you can see the full study for that at the link that's provided here, a CDC link, so you can go to that. So some more resources. Uh, there are multiple links here from CDC, CMS, KDHE, Department of KDM, Defensive County Health Department, CPAAA, uh, and some strategies to mitigate personnel staffing shortages and strategies for managing and searching healthcare provider demand. So these are all very uh, important and good resources for you that uh, we provided the link for. And of course, all the past webinars presented to the long-term care facilities and adult care homes can be viewed at the Sedgwick County COVID-19 resource webpage. And there is the link for that so that you can go find those past webinars. You can continue to contact me for any comments or questions. My email is on the slide here and a contact information in your emails that I've sent uh, inviting you to these webinars. And then if uh, anybody has any questions, uh, we have our presenters, Kaylee, Annette, and Cody here who will be happy to answer your questions. You can enter them in the chat box. Nobody is typing. Well, if we have no uh, questions in our uh, chat box today, then uh, you can follow up with me if something comes up and you can think of something following today's webinar. The uh, link to the recording and the slides will be sent out shortly. So you can watch your email for that and just follow up with me with any further questions. I did want to emphasize for those still on the call that we are glad to uh, receive your input for any topic ideas, uh, best practice ideas for the presentations going forward. Uh, and also, if anybody uh, has interest in being a featured speaker, uh, we'd be delighted to uh, involve you in that. So please do keep us in mind if uh, you're able to do any of that. Thank you. 
And uh, if there are no more questions being asked, then uh, we're probably going to sign off at 20 minutes before noon. So you have 20 minutes to go and do some other fun things for the day. Thank you very much for participating. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. And everybody have good, safe, happy holidays. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Susan. Have a wonderful Christmas. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. You too.